many of you found yourself whistling along with that? You just can't help it, right? Uh, what a good day to be together. Thanks for being here. If you're joining us online, glad that you're with us. I'm Dennis. I'm pastor of ministry development here, and it's just great to be together, isn't it? I heard a woman say to me this morning, you know, we came for the first time a couple weeks ago, and we thought, ah, oh, we'll maybe go back a couple times a month. She goes, you know what? We're going to be there every week because it was so good to be together, right? So... Well, in the medical and mental health care setting, there's an evaluative scale that they use to determine, to evaluate someone's grip on reality. So if you're uh, in a car wreck or if you're being mentally evaluated, they'll use this scale. They'll call you alert and aware times and then assign a number one to four. So if you're in a car wreck and uh, the personnel are with you, they'll go, uh, do you know who you are? And if you can answer your name, you are declared alert and aware times one, all right? And if you know who you are, and then they'll ask another question, do you know where you are? Yeah, I'm in an ambience. You're alert and aware times two, you know your location. Then they'll ask, uh, do you know what day it is? And, and if you can say it's Tuesday, they'll go, you're alert and aware times three. And if you can answer all those questions, and you also know what happened to you, I was in a car accident. I'm in an ambulance. Uh, it really hurts. Uh, they'll, they'll give you an alert and aware times four. But if you're missing any of those things, they'll just evaluate us there. And I thought, how many of us are alert and aware times zero when you get up in the morning until you've had your first cup of coffee? <laughs> Some of you go, yeah, they're, alert and aware. they're not alert and aware. They're alert and grumpy until they have their first cup of coffee. Well, if, what if we use this alert and awareness scale to evaluate ourselves throughout this whole series of the spirituality of happiness. Uh, are we alert and aware of our divine connection with God, of the science and what Scripture says about uh, what life is like, how to be happy? Are we alert and aware, of, these are some of the topics we hit every week, uh, about our gratitude, our mindfulness, our optimism? Are we alert and aware, we have a solid grip on reality about my physical uh, health, about my a character quotient, my, char my signature character gifts, and my kindness quotient. Are we alert and aware times four? And then uh, our anchor verse is Psalm 1, 1 and 2. Happy are those, alert and aware are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of the sinners that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord and on His law they meditate day and night. And so today we're going to take on what we're calling hallmark number six, which is personal soul care. Are we alert and aware times four when it comes to my awareness about what's going on in my soul, my health of my soul? Do we think about our souls much? Do we even know what our soul is? If I'm an alert and aware times four when it comes to my soul, this is what reality will be like. I know I am. I know my place, my place in my family, my neighborhood, my world, my church. I know my purpose. I know what time it is. In other words, what season of life I'm in and how my life connects to God's larger story and where that story seems to be moving. If I have, I'm alert and aware times four, I have a firm grip on reality as God designs, as God desires and displays and infuses reality with himself. In fact, professor, author, and spiritual guide Dallas Willard said this. This is your first fill in the blank for those of you who like to fill in the blanks. Your soul is the most important thing about you. So, if that's the case, evaluate yourself. If, again, if you're taking notes, you can write it in. If you're not, you can just make a mental evaluation of yourself. How, how alert and aware are you when it comes to your soul? Give yourself a number, one, two, three, or four. You see, the word soul is a bit of a weasel word, isn't it? You try to nail it down and it hops away, and you try to define it, and it, 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 it just kind of keeps, you can't quite get a grip on it. Even though in our culture, soul is a very, very popular idea. Ever heard of soul music? Yeah, soul music. Diana Ross, Marvin Gaye, Gladys Knight and the Pips, Stevie Wonder. Aretha Franklin was considered the queen of soul. We eat soul food. Some of us do. That's what it looks like. You eat a lot of that, you're going to see your soul real soon. <laughs> There's soul power. 
We talk about soul mates. There's a city called Soul City during an election cycle. Oftentimes, the political parties will say, the soul of America is at stake here. The CEO of Service Master wrote a book titled, The Soul of a Firm. Shortstop and team captain for the Yankees was known as the soul of the New York Yankees. Anybody know who this is? Ah, some baseball fans. Derek Jeter, soul of the Yankees. When a ship captain or an airline pilot counts the number of people on the manifest, they refer to them as this number of souls are on board. Apparently, you can sell your soul to the company stores, the old song went. You could sell your soul uh, to the devil, apparently. At least that's what Homer Simpson thinks and believes. I mean, one day he's tempted to sell his soul for the big price of one donut, which he consumed all but one bite, which he put in the refrigerator because he didn't want anybody to quite have complete control over his soul. You can buy a soul. A woman actually named Lori tried to sell her soul on eBay until eBay came up with a no soul selling policy. She listed it for the price of, guess what, $2,000. What's your soul worth? My question is, what would you get if you bought it? You can buy a soul. Here's a picture of one. <laughs> According to Harry Potter in the movies in the book, there is one thing you ought to fear because it can come to you and suck out your soul. What is it? Any Harry Potter fans? What can suck out your soul? A dementor. A dementor. Watch out for them, especially when you go home. On the internet, there's a list of 17 soul-crushing jobs. Number one, telemarketer. So be kind to your telemarketer next time they call. They're in a soul-crushing job. Don't, like, take your phone out and when they call, go... Don't do that. Don't say, I told you never to call this number. It's done, and there's blood everywhere. Don't do that to a telemarketer. Apparently, a soul has some weight. A doctor about 100 years ago took six patients who were about to die and weighed them. After, immediately after they died, weighed them again. And the difference was 21 grams. Science? or not science. May God rest their 21 gram souls. When someone is in trouble, the universal distress signal is what? S-O-S. Save our... Yeah, and I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're putting up the S-O-S symbol. Save our sermon, please, somebody. <laughs> well, Jesus talked a lot about the human soul. And one day a hotshot lawyer, probably from Harvard Law School, wink to Ryan, uh, asked Jesus this question, Professor, Rabbi, what do I need to do to get into the kind of life that God offers? And you'll recognize Jesus' response. Luke 10, 27 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, there it is, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And in this verse, Jesus lays out five elements of what makes us up as human beings. And Dallas Willard takes those five elements and expands them in a book called Renovation of the Heart. And he actually uses a, a drawing to describe how the soul fits in with the rest of our lives. And he says at the very center of a human being, we have what's called our will. And in biblical language, it's often referred to as the heart, the heart of the matter. It's what makes us human and not a plant. It makes us a someone and not a something. It's what helps us make choices, good or bad, we make choices. It what, it's what fuels creativity oftentimes is our will. And then surrounding our will is we have a mind, most of us, if you haven't lost it. And, and along with our mind comes our feelings. And uh, when he initially put these together, I thought, wait a minute, feelings are separate, they're, they're emotions. He goes, well, no, actually. You never have a feeling that doesn't have a thought attached. And so these two do go together. When we interact with our world, we have an emotional response. It's because, and how we, oftentimes even how we feel is how we think about that particular thing that happened. And then we all have a body. 
And uh, we, that's how we're known in this world, right? If we didn't have a body, we wouldn't know each other. It's like our little power packs that we, we uh, get along in the world. It's how we're present to one another. Our bodies act oftentimes according to how we think or how we feel. And sometimes our bodies help us understand how we think and how we feel. How our bodies look is a core part of our identity. And then there's the social aspect. We're all born into some kind of relational network, some kind of a family probably, a community, a culture, a country. And so how that interconnectedness often helps us understand who we are as people, and we can't ignore it. In fact, that's why when the lawyer came and asked Jesus about what's the most important thing, he didn't just say, you got to love God. He says, love your neighbor as yourself, because we're interconnected. It's an important part of our identity and what shapes us. And then the soul. The soul is the aspect of our human nature that integrates that speaks to and understands all of these different aspects of what's going on in our lives at any given moment. Dallas Willard writes this. He says, what matters most, what marks your existence, the really deep reason why human life matters so much is because of this tiny, fragile, vulnerable, precious thing about you called your soul. You're not just a self. You are a soul. You are a soul made by God, made for God, made to need God, made to run on God. Our soul is like the inner stream of water which gives strength, direction, and harmony to every other aspect of our life. When that stream is as it should be, we are constantly refreshed and exuberant in all that we do because our soul itself is then profusely rooted in the vastness of God and God's kingdom, including nature. And all else within us is enlivened and directed by that stream. Therefore, we are in harmony with God, reality, and the rest of human nature and nature at large. We are alert and aware times four. In fact, if we're very connected with God on an ongoing basis, I would say we're alert and aware times five. We're not just a self. The self is a standalone, do-it-yourself unit. And oftentimes people who don't access the spiritual dimension of their lives, it's just the self, and maybe it's their social. It's the self stuffed with the self and nothing else. And we see the tremendous value of a healthy soul, when Jesus asked this question in Matthew 16, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And Jesus is not asking a heaven question here. Jesus is asking a soul health diagnostic question, which I'm going to ask us. What do we often give in exchange for the health of our souls? Because what is running our lives at any given moment is our soul. Not external circumstances, although they play a part. Not our thoughts, not our intentions, not even our feelings. It's our souls that take in all of the input from all of these other aspects and in, into kind of a, what I call a soul stew. And we live out of that. We, we're nourished by that. And the healthier that stew is, the healthier that stream of water is, if you will, the healthier we can react into the outside world. Our souls combine all that together, and if our souls are healthy and God is a part of it, the result is that my normal day, normal peacemaking life is marked by, marked by great contentment, deep joy, and a healthy confidence in God. Now think of your car. We all drove here probably, or have a car, or ridden in one. There are a lot of different systems in a car. One of them is the system that moves us down the road. You can move down the road. You don't have to have air conditioning, heater. You don't even have, much, have to have a much of a cabin. If you have a, a propulsion system, you can go. But what if you have tires in that propulsion system that two of them are really out of balance? Some of us have done this. You're driving to Denver. You're driving. You get to about 65, and what happens? The front of your car starts to shake. And then if you push through it and get up to about 90, I've learned it like smooths out. If you have a flat tire, can you still go? Yes, and some of you have. Some of my kids have from time to time, and my spouse has once in a while, and I've reminded her, don't go when you have a flat tire. It creates whale of a lot of problems. Whale of a lot of problems. Again, you can go with an unhealthy system, but it's going to be difficult, and there's going to be some pain. So in this illustration, 
Our soul, our lives are like that entire car. All systems, when they're working in order and are healthy, the result is a joy-filled, confident, grateful ride. Doesn't mean it's problem-free. Not that. It's just that we can learn to respond in a way that's healthy. But here's the problem. The soul can get sick. The Bible has a word for this. Sin. And I know that we often equate sin with immoral behavior, but not all sin is intentional immoral behavior. Sin at times is doing those things that are destructive to my life or others, or not doing those things for my life that would be constructive for my life or others. You've heard Pastor Ryan say that sin is doing those things that wound, wound me, wound other people. But it also includes not doing those things that would lead to my spiritual health. For instance, a child that doesn't go to school. It's not immoral. It's not, a, it's not immoral not to go to school, but it will certainly affect the future of that child's life, won't it? In the book of James, there's a description of a person who has a sick soul. James 1.8 says that such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now, the word that's translated double-minded literally means double-souled or split-souled. And I think we know the reality of this because there's two me's. There's the me, the real me that I let you see, that there's the real me that I see, and there's the me that I let you see. And the me that I let you see doesn't always line up with the me that I see. And the closer we bring those two together, the closer we live an authentic life before God and before one another, the more single-souled we'll be. But many of us, we still do this, I do this, we like to dress up and pretty up the soul that I let you see because I want you to think well of me. I want you to think I'm smart and I'm bright and I have my stuff together. I don't really want you to see the, the interior is part of me. That's why Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 8, where he talks about when we get our interior world healthy, we can deal with our exterior world in a healthy way because we can never control the exterior world. So if we live our lives trying to control the exterior world, guess what's going to happen? You're going to drive yourself crazy because you cannot do it. It's just too big, too complex, and too complicated. The thing that I can most influence about is my interior world. And so Jesus says, you're blessed when you get your inside world. This is Matthew 5, 8. Your mind and heart, and I would add the rest of this, put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. I'm going to give you five symptoms of a sick soul. Number one, we have difficulty making decisions. Steve Jobs, who's the co-founder of Apple, was certainly a single-minded person when it came to decision-making. It is said that he had a wardrobe made up of two things, blue jeans and what? A black turtleneck. Why? He said, I don't want to waste any of my decision-making energy in the morning deciding what I'm going to wear. Some of us could actually use some of this. A healthy soul is able to say yes to the most important things and no to the less important things, and everybody's okay with it, especially inside that person. Number two, symptom. We feel constantly vulnerable to people or other circumstances. We're always checking outside to know, I, I get my interior equilibrium by what's going on around me and what people think and what people do and how are they going to react if I decide this or that. Pontius Pilate's probably the best example of a sick soul, one of them. He couldn't decide what to do with Jesus. He couldn't figure out. It was all about the external world. Jesus, what do you think I should do with you? Uh, my, my other uh, political leaders, what do you think I should do with Jesus? Uh, he goes to the religious leaders. What do you think I should do to Jesus? A sick soul would only do this. Take the Son of God, God in human form, and leave his crucifixion decision up to an angry, ravenous mob. Our souls are sick when we are overly concerned about what others think or do. We live with high levels of fear and anxiety. Number three, we lack patience. In fact, if this is you, you probably think patience is for wimps. You're driving down the, and this is how you know if you like are impatient. You're driving to Denver on I-25, and you get stuck behind a truck, and there's a slow-moving car right beside you, and you're just hemmed in. And this starts to go on, and they go slower and slower. And you can look around and go, hey, the both lanes are clear up front. And you drive that way for a while, you could be sick with impatience if you realize after 10 minutes you've been plotting the murder of the person next to you. 
Or you might have a sick soul if you are shopping in a grocery line and you pull up to the line that says 15 items or less and you know you have 17 items. <laughs> and there's a person in front of you with a pretty full cart. And so you make it very obvious so that you lean over, you catch their eye and you start counting the items in their cart. And you count out loud, 16, 17, 18, 19, and you look them in the eye and you go, well, I never. And you take your cart and you move to the other 15 item line. You might be impatient if that's you. Or you might have experienced internet impatience. You're lo loading a movie, right? Or you're loading a movie in and it won't load in in like five seconds. So you go, oh, I need to refresh. And you hit the refresh button and it doesn't refresh right away. So you hit the refresh button again. You go, oh no, maybe it'll open in Chrome. And so you click over into Chrome and you open it and it won't open. And all of a sudden you go, oh, I'm going to shut down my computer. I'm going to pick a different movie. Any of you ever have any internet impatience? And then you run around the office screaming, the internet is so slow, the internet is so slow here. A healthy soul is at rest even when life is busy and hectic. There's a sense of pace and rhythm and proportion even when life is busy. Here's a fourth symptom. We're easily thrown off our game. Has anyone ever ridden one of those mechanical bulls? Anybody? I have. I have. In fact, this was, uh, not especially proud of this, but we were at a cowboy restaurant and bar in Wyoming one time, and uh, they had a mechanical bull, and my buddies talked me into riding it. And I thought, what, 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 I, I grew up on a ranch, I grew up on a farm, I have some experience in riding animals. I did the mutton busting contest when I was in the fifth grade. Sheep, bull, both farm animals, how hard can this be? So I walk up to get on the mechanical bull, and the guy goes, come here. And he makes me sign away this form, this like 12-page form that basically says, if you're going to be this stupid, don't blame us. Right? That's what it is. And so I get on this thing and he says, okay, let me coach you a little bit. There are 12 levels of difficulty, but here's the deal. Uh, stay loose. If you try to clamp down and get a grip on this external part of your, you're going to get tossed off. So you got you to gotta stay loose. You got to stay centered. You got to keep your gravity, you know, close to the bull. You got you to ride like that. And I thought, I could do this. So he cranks it up. I get on. He cranks it up. I think we have a picture of me. There it is. And uh, don't look too close because that's not really me. But anyway, <laughs> I'm riding this thing. And, uh, and, and he starts to turn up. I look over there. He grins. He starts to turn up the dial. You know, and the thing starts flailing around, and I first I fall off one side, and then I think in my brain, I go, my automatic response is, I got to get a hold of this thing. So I grab on, and then I realize, hey, that's the best way to get tossed. You got to stay loose. So I stayed loose. I mean, there were some things in me that loosened up that I don't know, even though I think they're still loose. And I, I rode the thing, and he turns it down, and it finally stops. You know how long a bull ride is, right? Eight seconds. It seemed like 20 minutes. And I grin, it's like, hey, I got this thing. And he looks at me and he says, that was level one. <laughs> Cranks the knob and in three seconds later, this is, what's, this is me, right? There we go. But a healthy soul stays centered, has that centeredness of gravity, doesn't grip onto external circumstances like it's, like, like it's their life is at stake. And so people who have sick souls are easily thrown off their game. You don't stay loose. Take things as they come. You always feel out of control or flailing around. Here's number five. Anyone here exhibit... Uh, we find our identity in externals. You don't stay... You, you defi we define ourselves by our trophies, by our accomplishments, by our positions, by those things that are... awards that are hanging on our wall or degrees that are hanging on our wall or the title on the front of our desk or the uh, emblem on the front of our car or the sign in front of our neighborhood that we happen to live in, our friends, our family. And if we don't do that, sometimes we, I, we get our identity from our kids' success and our kids' all of that stuff. So those are the five symptoms. Anyone here exhibit any one of those five? Uh, and if it's not you, do you know someone like you might live with that exhibits at least one of them? Well, let me give us some help, all right? How do we have a healthy soul? How do we do that? Well, Jesus tells a parable one day. It's a story, really. And I took a little liberty with this story, as you'll see, but you'll probably recognize it. 
If you're from the south, you'd call it the parable of the souls. And here's how it goes. Mark 4, 3 through 8. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering his seed, some fell on the soul of the hard path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soul. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell on the thorny soil where weeds grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. You see, a healthy soil thrives and grows and produces fruit. And even though the first three soil souls are not fruitful, they do hold the keys to a healthy soul. And here's the first key, and it's this. Get soft. Get a softer soul. See, the hard soul is cynical, bitter, suspicious, guarded. It didn't start out that way. That's not how a path gets formed in a field in those days in that culture. The way a path got formed in a field, people just kept walking over the same thing, the same spot, and eventually it got hard. And there's some of us who've been walked over and walked on, and because of that, you've armored up, to borrow a Brene Brown term. You put on your armor. You guard. You don't want to let anybody in there because if you do, it's going to hurt. And so you have a hard path. And sometimes that hardness can turn into cynicism and bitterness. Those hurts weren't grieved. They weren't forgiven. And now you've got a hard path through the middle of your life. To have a soft soul, it means, I mean, humble, receptive, eager to learn, eager to learn something new, eager to take what I already know and re-examine it. And I think especially this, but soft souls, they're quick to love. Quick to love. It's automatic. The kind thought, the kind heart, the kind action. Jesus was quick to love, and especially quick to love people who thought they were on the outside, couldn't belong, were rejected and left out. Quick to love. So the basic posture of a soft soul toward God is yes, yes, and we're quick to love. The second kind of soul that this parable talks about is the shallow or rocky soul. And my point here, the antidote would be to go deep, go deeper. You see, the kind of soil it's talking about there is you've got a shallow layer of topsoil and a big layer of rock right underneath it. And you plant a seed in there and it waters and the seed springs up immediately. But when the sun comes out, because the plant has no root, it hasn't gone down deep, it withers and dies had a conversation with a pastor two weeks ago, he and his wife, not from this community. And I asked him why churches that are inclusive and diverse and more open seem to be not seem to be, don't seem to be growing as fast as other churches who aren't that way. And his response was, well, you can decide how, what you think of his response. I just say it's very passionate. He said this, lots of people are afraid to ask questions and are afraid to question the answers they were taught as kids. He says they don't want the struggle. They want easy. They want security. They don't want gray. They want clarity. They don't want complexity. They want simplicity. They don't want a big, vast, mysterious God with a little bit of personal understanding. They want their little bit of personal understanding and about this much mystery of God. I thought, ooh, he feels kind of strong about this. He went on. He says, they don't want various and sometimes competing interpretations of the Bible. They want someone who's been to seminary or at least Bible school or at least knows someone who knows someone who has read someone who did those things to tell them exactly what the Bible says so they don't have to struggle with ambiguity. And then he said this, people's faith is simply too shallow. When we said all that, I thought, well, all righty then. I wonder about the Rockies. I mean, he was passionate about this. And here's the truth. If you stick around Crossroads, if you do, I guarantee you that our desire is to help you go deeper in your understanding of what we know about God and broaden our understanding or acceptance of the deep mystery of God. You'll probably be challenged to change your mind about some things, especially about who and how we love. 
Because around here, maturity is not going to be measured by how much we know. It's not going to be measured by how much we do. The yardstick for measuring maturity around here, which we think follows Jesus' maturity, is how much we love. Can we honestly say that we love God with our whole soul? With all of this, body, soul, mind, spirit, can we say that? Can we honestly say that we love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves? Well, I have a ways to go, and my hunch is many of you do too, and we're going to try to do it together. You can help me, and we'll try to help you. And here's the third thing. We need to learn to unclutter our lives. The third unproductive soil never produces fruit, not because it didn't grow stuff. Oh, my goodness. It had all kinds of stuff growing in that field. It says weeds were growing in that field and thorns. Well, here's the definition of a weed. A weed isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's a plant that's growing out of place. So, for instance, when we grew up, we planted bean fields. And guess what came up sometimes? Corn. Dad would go out there and go, go pull all the corn out of that field. Wait a, wait, wait a minute. Corn is good. Corn is good, but not in the bean field. And I think sometimes many of us, we, we want to grow beans and corn and olives and pecans and alligators all in the same field. <laughs> so we need to unclutter our lives a bit. Dallas Willard was asked, what is the secret to a healthy soul? He said this, ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your lives. And why is it that we're in a hurry oftentimes? is because we have too many plants we're trying to grow in the same field of my life. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry. You can be busy and not hurried. Busy is a state of our schedule. Hurry is the posture of our soul. And the hurry that most of us experience isn't because we're doing good things and bad things. It's because we're trying to do too many good things. In fact, go re-listen to Ryan's sermon from last week, and he talks a lot about developing margin in our lives. There's some great suggestions there. And here's the deal. It won't just happen automatically. We have to do some things. And so this is the question. What's God inviting us into today? And so I'm going to go back over these three things. Go deep. Go get soft and unclutter and give us some practical suggestions on how we could do that. So the get soft key action is love. A soft soul is an overtly loving soul, person. And, I, and again, this happens in normal everyday circumstances. Say yes to those little God nudges throughout the day to love, extend love to a person. A person, when I was working on this on Friday, a person called me out of the blue. I haven't talked to him for 15 years. He called me and said, hey, Dennis, I came across your name, and he said, I just thought I'd give you a call. He says, I, I appreciate you. He says, I love you. I just want you to know that. I thought, there's a guy who responded to a God nudge because he needed, my, he needed to know that I was loved by him. And, and that was awesome. It was awesome. So when you get those little God nudges, just do them. Just do them. Write the note. Send the text. Invite him out to dinner. Whatever the nudge is, respond. You know, last week, Ryan talked about buy a, cut, a Costco chicken pot pie and put it in your freezer because somebody in your neighborhood is going to need a meal sometime, and now you're ready. I loved what he said last week. He says, it's not about doing random acts of kindness. It's about doing intentional, prepared acts of kindness. That's what loving people mostly do. I love that. And when that little girl or boy sets up that lemonade stand in your neighborhood, stop it, everyone. Pay double. Pay triple. Because one day you will have one of your kids or grandkids down there, or you have had, and you understand the impact of a neighbor that comes by and says, I'll give you $5 for a $1 glass of weak, warm lemonade. <laughs> because it's not about the lemonade, it's about the... It's so great. So let's learn to love. Here's the second thing. You know, to go, the, the go deep action is to ponder. Stay curious. Don't close off your mind or your heart to things. When you're challenged with a new idea or thought about God that makes you uncomfortable or upset or tempt you to go to another church, keep listening. Keep probing. Be willing to push through it. In fact, be willing to stay in that discomfort for a while. That's how we grow. That's how we learn. We have to go through oftentimes this period of disorientation and discomfort. Sometimes we have to unknow some things in order to move beyond that to something that's bigger and larger and probably more mysterious 
and maybe less certain, but it's bigger and more free. I was reading one author that, that I've been reading a lot this last few years, and he said this, people stop reading me too soon. So don't stop listening too soon. Hang in there, ask questions, make an appointment. Call one of us and go, can we talk about this? I don't quite get it. Can you explain this to me? So let's ponder together, all right? That's part of our life together is to ponder together. Okay, last one. Unclutter, key action, savor. Savor. We don't need all those activities that oftentimes we have signed up for. We don't. And neither do our kids or grandkids. Sometimes I wonder if we do it because of us. We want them to be successful, and I need to feel successful, so I want them to do that. And here's the truth. You've heard this statement. I'm just going to do more with less. Well, here's the tricky part of that. When you start to do more with less, initially less feels like less. It just feels like less. We have to get used to that. And if we stay in that less moment, we will begin to learn to do this, and this is the word savor. Savor. Linger. Linger. Savor. it. Savor moments. Many of you know our son has triplet daughters who will be three in August. And this last week, they have a strawberry patch in their backyard. So I was there for a little bit, and I told the girls, hey, let's go out, and I'll pick you some strawberries. So I went out there, and I start picking strawberries, and there's three of them, right? And they're almost three. They like strawberries. And so I, I'm picking them out of the patch, and I'm putting them in this hand. And uh, uh, Stella and Cora come, and they eat a few, and then they wander off to do something else. But Ivy, Ivy, here's a picture of her. Strawberry after strawberry. She's just standing right there, and she'd go, she has a deep voice. She goes, Mo. <laughs> Mo. Mo. She was like a, a, a gambling addict in Las Vegas feeding coins into a slot machine. <laughs> Mo. And I remember one time I said to Ivy, I said, Ivy, have you tasted any of the 57 strawberries you've just eaten? And so I think that as we learn to savor our lives, instead of always going to God, Mo, 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 a savor moment would be to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, look at that, look at that. Because we're going to get all kinds of strawberry moments in our lives. And some of us, we just, we just gorge ourselves. One, 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 one. Mo, mo. Learn to savor these strawberry moments, like, like a conversation that you get into. And I know you got stuff to go, places to go, and people to see. But what's going on right now is so rich and important. You just savor the conversation. And, and you know you're saving the conversation when your soul steps out of yourself and says to yourself, this is a powerful moment, Dennis. Stay in it. That's your soul talking to you. Stay here. This is wonderful. This is rich. This is loving. Stay in this moment. That's your soul talking to you. Or maybe your soul moment is going to be a strawberry moment would be at sunrise. You get up, you walk out in the yard and Instead of pulling all those weeds, you just smell the freshness of the morning, the rain from last night. You look at one flower instead of 45. Just look deeply at the flower. Or if you're at home and you're changing your 14th diaper of the hour and trying to cram mac and cheese down the throats of your three children that are all under the age of seven because you have places to go and, and instead of doing that you pause and you, you rub your hand over that baby's cheek and you look in their eyes you see the sparkle and you see the life and you see the love coming back to you strawberry moment savor it and when you're wiping the mac and cheese off your kid's face savor it Eat some of it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> savor it. Look in their eyes. Savor those moments. We have moments each week here at, at Crossroads and online. and where They're strawberry moments. They're intended to, to help us enter into it fully so that 
all things line up and that stream that God has that he wants to freshen up and bring into our lives every day is fresh and life-giving. So, do you want to have a healthy soul? Do you want to have a soul that's soft and it's going deeper and it's uncluttered and you can savor, quick to love? Do you want to have that kind of life? It's available. It's available. We're going to do a song, the band's going to lead us, and it's, it really talks about how to think about ourselves, how to treat ourselves in this soul-shaping process, and it also tells us how God thinks of us as we do this. Then I'm going to come back, we'll have, a, we'll have one more thing I want to do, which, don't leave, I think it's, I think it's an important step. So let's do this song.